بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم Let's get started inshallah Is everyone, can everyone online hear me? Yes, okay Alhamdulillah, sorry for the late starts inshallah We are uh, just having some technical difficulties <clears throat> So it's been a few weeks since we've had Sira. And so let's just refresh exactly where we are right now. So the Prophet Muhammad is going through the journey of Isra and Mi'raj, which is probably one of the most epic stories in the Sira. A lot of detail, a lot of lessons, a lot of significance. So we're taking our time going through this story. We spent about three to four weeks on it now. Don't be surprised if we spend still another three to four weeks on it, inshallah ta'ala. So far, what has happened is the journey of the Isra portion of the Isra wal Mi'raj. We have talked about how the Prophet ﷺ was awoken by Jibreel alayhi salam. We talked about how the Prophet ﷺ once again had the splitting of the chest occur, where his heart was cleansed and taken out and washed. And then we talked about how he rode on the Buraq all the way from Mecca to Jerusalem. On the way there, we talked about many things the Prophet ﷺ saw. That the veil of the unseen was lifted a little bit for the Prophet ﷺ to see different uh, virtues, different glad tidings of the believers, and also different punishments of people who uh, do not follow Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger. And then when they ended up in Masjid al-Aqsa, the Prophet ﷺ, he tied the Buraq on a post where Prophets uh, tied their animals in the past, and then the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went into Masjid Al-Aqsa and he prayed two raka'at and then after he was done praying his two raka'at, he witnessed all the Prophets that have ever existed in one vicinity in Masjid Al-Aqsa. One narration tells us it was 125,000 when another narration, Musnad Imam Ahmad, narrated by Abu Hurairah, tells us that it was almost 300,000 Prophets in that vicinity. And so after every, all of them were gathered, they spoke amongst one another to see who will lead. And the Prophet Muhammad was appointed to be the one who leads all the Prophets in prayer, in two raka'at. And after the prayer concluded and the Prophet Muhammad turned to face the Prophets, a conference, if you will, of Prophets began where all the different Prophets started speaking, sharing reflections, sharing reminders. Ibrahim salam spoke, Musa salam spoke, Dawood salam spoke, Suleiman salam spoke, Isa salam spoke. And then the last one was finally the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa And he spoke praises of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he talked about his message and his vision and his mission and why he was sent. And then Ibrahim alayhi salam after that concluded, he said, this is why Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa has the most virtue amongst us all. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose this individual for this task. It is a very beautiful moment that after all the difficulties that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa faced, all the difficulties he had been dealing with in Mecca, there has been such a difficult experience for him. This experience right here of Isra al-Maraj, of just talking to all the individual Prophets, was a very heart-lifting experience. That the best of mankind has his back. The best of mankind is telling him how, how great of a man he is. And they're looking up to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu And so the people that the Prophet Sallallahu looks, look, himself looks up to are looking up to him in this moment, right? Almost kind of like a teacher or the student surpasses the teacher type moment. And so now he has this new inspiration, this new motivation, this new energy of all the negative energy that was facing him before has now been cleansed because of his conversation with the many different prophets. And then after that, they began to talk amongst themselves about the final hour, the end of times and the day of judgments. And they all deferred to Ibrahim salam, and they asked him what he thinks. And he says, I don't really have any knowledge of what will occur. And they asked amongst the different prophets until Isa alayhi salam, because he is actually amongst the signs of the final hour and the day of judgment. He uh, shares some details that he knows that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him about, about the last day. Right, and the last hour and the last day of judgment, but not the not necessarily specifically when exactly it will happen, but some signs, right, and some things that will happen, and some things that he will do himself before the day of judgment is established. And so after that, the Prophet ﷺ, after all this different conversation, 
the Prophet is now sitting in Bayt al-Maqdis, right, in Masjid al-Aqsa. And he sits there for a bit longer. And then he suddenly became extremely thirsty. You have to remember how long of a journey this has been for him. In our timeline, this is a blink of an eye. Because you'll see later on that at the end of the story, the, the, the narrations say that, that it's like the curtain has just started swinging. You know, when you like uh, uh, go out of a cur or from a curtain and the curtain kind of swings a little bit, Prophet says he left his home and came back and the curtain was still swinging. So it's like almost like a blink of an eye in our timeline, right? But this is all happening. This is a miracle, right? This is a miracle. This is all happening outside of our conception of time. So the Prophet has gone through a very long journey at this point. And not once have they stopped to drink water. Not once have they stopped to eat, get, eat some food. They didn't stop on any gas station on the way. They didn't stop at Bucky's or anything. They don't, No, none of that. Right? Anybody know Bucky's? Right? Texas? Yes, sir. Okay. Alhamdulillah. So they didn't stop anywhere. So they, 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 this is a very difficult journey, right? It's a physically difficult journey as well. So the Prophet ﷺ, now he's extremely thirsty. And the Prophet ﷺ himself, he says, so the Prophet ﷺ, he became very thirsty. And he says that I have not recalled a time where I've ever felt more thirsty in my entire life. And so there are two narrations. One narration says there was two bowls that were presented to him. And another narration that says there was three bowls or cups that were brought to the Prophet Muhammad Sallam, And they were placed in a row in front of the Prophet. And all three bowls were covered. And so the Prophet Sallam, he took the first bowl that was on the right and he drank from it. And this bowl had honey in it. It had honey in it. And the Prophet Sallam, he took a very small sip and he put the bowl back down. Then... The Prophet ﷺ took the second bowl and he realized that it had milk in it. And he drank the entire bowl of milk until he became full. And then he put the bowl back down. Then the third bowl was offered to the Prophet ﷺ and he did not even touch it. He did not even look at it. He did not even want to go near it at all. He declined. He said, no, I'm good. I'm completely full. So Ibrahim السلام, was actually watching all of this and he was described as an elderly and handsome and honorable and distinguished looking man. And he said to the Prophet Muhammad السلام, says, you've done the right thing. And then Jibreel السلام, he grabbed the Prophet السلام, by the shoulders and patted him congratulations, right? As if they're, they're buddies, right? Jibreel السلام, Prophet السلام, they, have a, they have a friend relationship, right? They have a teacher-student relationship, but they're also very close in the way friends are as well. And so Jibreel alayhi salam says, you've done the right thing. You have done what was right. And Jibreel alayhi salam then explained what were in these bowls. He said the first bowl was honey. And then not only explained the physical aspect of these bowls, but also what these bowls emphasized and what they symbolized. So the first bowl was honey. right? The first bowl was honey. And he said that you took a little bit from it. And if you would have indulged into it, then your ummah would have drowned into the desires and materialism of this world. So the honey, the bowl of honey represents what? What does it represent? The dunya, right? It represents material, it represents desires, it represents the world. And so it was representative of that glamour, of the glitz and glamour and materials of this world. And so he said that your ummah meant to take this sweetness in moderation. That, you know, the, the, the dunya mata, the Prophet ﷺ said that the, the dunya is enjoyment. We can enjoy the dunya, but we have to enjoy it in moderation, right? That we eat to live, we don't live to eat, right? We eat to live, but we don't live to eat. We can enjoy what we're eating, but it's not like we are living our whole lives trying to find the next best, the, the next best meal and etc. So it's really important that we keep this in mind when we are going through our lives that we are not overindulging in the dunya. The Prophet ﷺ took a sip of the honey. Meaning it is allowed to indulge in the dunya, to engage in the dunya, but the things that are permissible, and even then not too much of it as well, which we will talk about inshallah ta'ala a little bit more later. And then Jibreel alayhi salam, he continued and he said the middle bowl had milk. The middle bowl had milk. And remember, what did the Prophet ﷺ do with the milk? What did he do? We just talked about it. He finished the entire thing. He drank till, till it was full. So what do you think this emphasizes? 
What do you think the, the, the symbolism here with the milk is? Sorry? Uh, yeah, maybe a little bit, but what else? What, sorry, what was that? Fitra, yeah, okay. I'm looking for something a little bit more detailed. Hidayah, guidance. The, the religion, the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which cleanliness and fitra plays an aspect in that, but the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so it's saying here what? It's saying here that no matter how much religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you will engage in, it is good for you. It is good for you. You, you didn't just take a sip from the milk. He took the entire milk. He took the entire bowl. So take the entire deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as much of, uh, as you can of it. And so it's very significant too that the Prophet whenever he would drink milk, what was the dua that he would make? Allahumma barik li fihi wa zidni minhu. Right? Allah, so we would thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he says, Oh Allah, increase this upon me. Right? Have more, put barakah in this uh, for me. And it's also why in multiple dreams, many sahaba, when they would narrate dreams, Umar al-Khattab, Abu Bakr siddiq radiallahu and the Prophet uh, uh, would be in their dreams, they would oftentimes be drinking milk together. Right? So this milk is representative of knowledge and guidance. And so Jibreel alayhi salam, then he said what? The third bowl, which you did not even touch or even know what was in it since all the bowls were covered. He said, this, is, this bowl, it had wine in it. It had wine in it, it had khamr in it. Now keep in mind, is khamr prohibited? Right now in this point of the seerah, is khamr prohibited? It is not, actually. The companion, some of the companions would still drink wine, right? And so the, 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 the prohibition of wine happened in stages. And so at this stage, in the Meccan period of the Prophet ﷺ, khamr has not been completely prohibited yet. Right? And so the Prophet ﷺ has never touched wine in his entire life. This is of the, the, the purity of the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, right? But technically speaking, it is not haram at this point. So if he did drink it, it would not cause, it would not be any fault, would not be any sin to him. But because he's a Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him that inclination to never want to go near things that can, uh, you know, cause a deficiency in intellect or even have uh, physical harms of the body as well. So, that third bowl, right? Although Jibreel salam says that if you would have taken from it, then your ummah would have become lost and misguided. And so the people uh, also would not believe you except for very, very little if you had taken this bowl, right? This bowl of khamar, and it's representative of the evil that is in this world. And so there are three elements that exist in this world. There's the deen, right? Which is represented by the, by which bowl? Milk, there's the that things that are permissible, which is represented by which bowl? The honey. And then that is things which are impermissible, which is represented by the khamar, the wine. And so the deen, it, the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the sunnah, this is our basis. This is our foundation. This is how we identify ourselves. And with that which is permissible, these are things that are there for us to access and take from as needed. We have been granted a lot of discretion as to how much and what we interact with. And then the impermissible things, first of all, when it comes to the impermissible things, the default Islamic ruling for things is that they are permissible. The default Islamic ruling for things is that they are permissible. When it comes to ibadah, acts of worship, right? The, the principle is what? The principle is that things are not permissible until proven permissible. Right? You can't make up acts of ibadah essentially. The ibadah has to come from the sunnah. There has to be evidence for the ibadah that you do, right? Because you can't just make up your own acts of worship. But when it comes to worldly things, business transactions, things that we eat, relationships that we have, etc., the default is the opposite. They're permissible until proven haram, right? They're permissible until proven haram. This is a very important principle because oftentimes we operate backwards, right? We, 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 in terms of our spirituality, we want to do whatever we want to do and whenever we want to do it. But when it comes to our worldly things, we want to like find evidence for every little thing. But it's actually the opposite, right? That the, by default, everything in Islam in terms of the worldly things are permissible until proven haram. And the list of things that are haram are extremely minor. They seem like a lot because shaitan has successfully tricked the majority of humanity into driving themselves towards the haram. And so when all of society is acting and all of society is based on the few things that are haram, the Muslims are going to feel like everything is haram. But in reality, this, the list of things is, that is very minor, the list of things that you can't consume is very small compared to the things that we can consume. Right? Uh, so, 
There are very few things that are, are impermissible, and that's why it's even more important for us to avoid them, because we have so much access as well to things that are permissible. And so this is our task, right? We have been tasked with avoiding the haram. We're not tasked with uh, uh, playing with the haram. Some people will kind of like poke at the haram as well, right? Like how haram is it? Is it just makru? Is it like makru tanzihi, makru tahrimi, right? Like alcohol is impermissible, sure, but what if I sell it and don't drink it, right? What if it's just like a little bit that I don't get intoxicated by it, right? Like, like these questions that, that might come up, we're, all, we're always trying to poke and play with fire, right? Can I, right? What if I put a glove on it, right? What if I take a riba contract and just change up the words a little bit and it's the same thing, but kind of not, and then just call it not a riba contract? Can, like, can I, can I do that? So the, the, these are, are, are tricks that shaitan tries to play with us so that we can try to halalify the haram. But the Prophet method, methodology was, let, was what? The Quranic methodology is what? وَلَا تَقْرَبُوا zina. Don't even go near it. Don't even go near a fornication. Don't even gear, uh, go near adultery. And so when the, when the Mufassirun talk about what does going near it mean, it means like, you know, lower your gaze, right? Well, we don't even uh, shake hands with the opposite gender. There's no physical contact between the opposite gender unless they are mahram or married to one another. We're not even going, we're going to put every possible means in front of us for us, uh, every block in front of us for us to not engage into that haram or to fall into that haram, right? So we don't, we don't go near it as a wala taqarabu zina. And as an ummah, the majority of us, you know, alhamdulillah, we're Muslims, so we try to stay away and avoid those things as much as possible. The things that are clearly impermissible. But once we've graduated past that level of trying to avoid everything that is impermissible, uh, we want to even take moderation. The second level now after that is to take moderation in the things that are permissible and halal. That even within that, we must learn to practice moderation. And so this was exemplified by the Prophet ﷺ only taking a sip of honey, which is permissible. He didn't need to do more than that. He didn't need to take more than that. Because if he did, he could end up resulting in some type of harm, right? And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even in Surah Al-Araf, he says, وَكُولُوا وَشْرَبُوا وَلَا تُسْرِفُوا إِنَّهُ لَا يُحِبُّ الْمُسْرِفِينَ That eat and drink, right? But do not be wasteful. Do not, do not waste. And wasteful can be two things. One thing of wasteful can be just the, what, the obvious, which is what? Just throwing things away, wasting food, not finishing your food, not finishing your plate. The other thing that could be called possibly be wasteful is you consume more than you need to. Right? You consume a lot more than you need to. So like there's, there's other people in the gathering and you are, you know, I'll give you an example, right? Like Ramadan, for example, everybody wants seconds when not everybody has got, gotten their first yet. And so there's, there's food that is enough for everybody, but then when one person takes two or three plates, then there's going to be one or two people that don't get their food. So he finished his two or three plates, so is he being wasteful? Yes, he's being wasteful. Because he did not need those two or three plates, and somebody else needed those two or three plates. Right? So, uh, uh, And so the Prophet Wasallam taught us that uh, when something is okay, and can initially be good, overindulging in that thing can be harmful, right? Sugar, is sugar halal or haram? It's halal. If the only thing you ate in your life is sugar, what would happen to you? You die pretty quickly, right? So there, even in things that are halal, there can be harm in it if we overindulge in it. And it's also extremely important for us to hold ourselves accountable when it comes to these things, when it comes to the impermissible things and when it comes to overindulging in the halal. Because on the day of judgment, we are going to be the only people that have to account for our actions. We treat shaitan as public enemy number one as Muslims. But the reality is he's actually public enemy number two. What did I say? Public enemy number two. Who's the first enemy? Nafs. It's your nafs. Because in Ramadan, when shaitan is locked up, do people still fall into their nafs? Why isn't everybody a perfect Muslim in Ramadan then? If shaitan is the only reason why we fall into our desires and why we engage with, uh, uh, with, with the material or engage in our desires and etc. Right? Our nafs is what we need to control even more 
than shaitan because we will be asked about what we did. Shaitan will not be asked about what we did. And it says this in the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells us this in the Quran, in Surah Ibrahim, that there will be a conversation between shaitan and his followers. That shaitan will say that Allah made you a promise and I made you a promise, but my promise failed you. And I did not have any authority over you. I only called you towards haram and you responded to me. So don't, not, don't blame me. Blame yourself. I did not do anything. I can't save you. You can't save me. I can't do anything for you. You can't do anything for me. Right? And he says, I, I, dis I disassociate from you. All the actions that you did because of me, I disassociate from you. You have to answer to Allah now. Right? And so it's important that we work against our nafs constantly. And we don't just start blaming shaitan for all the things that we fall into. We look inwards ourselves. We look towards ourselves and we control our nafs as much as we can. And this is, a very, this is exemplified in the prophets. Look at, look at the story of uh, Adam alayhi salam. When Adam alayhi salam and Hawa alayhi salam, when they were, uh, when shaitan came and confused them and they ate from the tree, what was the dua that they made? What was the dua? Rabbana zalamna, what? Anfusana, right? Oh Allah, we wronged ourselves. They didn't point fingers at shaitan and said, he caused us to do this. He, he's the reason. Blame him, punish him, don't punish us. He says, no, 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 we did it, right? Somebody called us towards haram. We knew it was wrong and we still did it, right? So let's not, let's not fool ourselves in thinking that we can get away with uh, haram on the day of judgment by blaming somebody else, right? We have to hold ourselves accountable as much as we can. And so Ibrahim alayhi salam, now back to the story. Ibrahim alayhi salam, he told Jibreel alayhi salam, أَخْذَ صَاحِبُكَ الْفِطْرَةَ وَإِنَّهُ لَمُهْتَدٍ That your, your friend Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam, he truly has a great fitrah. Right? He has this inherent quality, this nature that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instilled within him. That he chose those two, the honey and the milk, and avoided the wine. And so definitely this person, this, this prophet of Allah is definitely guided by Allah. And so Jibreel told the Prophet ﷺ that if you would have drunk from the wine, your ummah would have been lost and very few would have followed you. And there's a deep, profound lesson here. That the Prophet ﷺ is meant to be the deliverer of the message to people and a guide to mankind. And so if he himself engaged in an inappropriate activity, it would minimize the impact of the message upon the people that he's trying to deliver to. And so, of course, the Prophet was the exemplar of this. He was the model of perfection when it came to living what you preach. So the lesson that's being taught to us is that if we don't live what we preach, not only will we be accountable for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but also don't underestimate the fact that even the impact of what you preach will be minimized. So if you want to be someone who gives da'wah, you want to be someone that calls people towards Islam and calls people towards becoming Muslim or calling Muslims to become better Muslims or teach Muslims to increase in their knowledge, your impact will directly result to your own personal practice. And so when you see these institutions or see these ulama or these teachers and they're producing thousands and hundreds of students, know that there's sincerity behind that. Insha'Allah ta'ala. And so, alright, back to the timeline. ثُمَّ أُتِيَ بِالْمِعْرَاجِ الَّذِي تَعْرُجُ عَلَيْهِ أَرْوَاحُ بَنِي آدَمِ And then a staircase was brought to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is the same staircase that all the souls of the children of Adam will take to the heavens. فَلَمْ يُرَى الْخَلْقُ أَحْسَنَ مِنَ الْمِعْرَاجِ لَهُ مِرْقَاتٌ مِنْ فِضَّةٍ وَمِرْقَاتٌ مِنْ ذَهَبٍ وَفِي رِوَايَةٍ لِأَبِي سَعِيدٍ فِي شَرَفِ الْمُصْطَفَى أَنَّهُ أُتِيَ بِالْمِعْرَاجِ مِنْ, جن من جَنَّةِ الْفِرْدَوْسِ مُنَضَّدٌ بِلُؤْلُؤٌ That the Prophet وسلم, when he's recalling this, he says that he had never seen anything more beautiful than that staircase. At this point in his life, he has never seen anything more beautiful than this staircase. It was very beautiful. It had a lot of, it was very um, ornate. And so the Prophet ﷺ, he says, one step was made of gold and then another step was made of silver. And it was completely decorated. 
And there's in one narration by a companion by the name of Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, who states that the entire staircase was fixed with gems and jewels and minerals from Jannat al-Firdaus. عَنْ يَمِينِهِ مَلَائِكُتٌ وَعَنْ يَسَارِهِ مَلَائِكُتٌ فَصَعِدَ هُوَ وَجِبْرِيلِ حَتَّى أَنْتَهَيَا إِلَى بَابٍ مِنْ أَبْوَابِ السَّمَاءِ الدُّنْيَا And so on both sides of the staircase, there were angels that were lined up, like a royal escort. And so Jibreel alayhi salam and the Prophet ﷺ, they began to climb up these stairs until they reached a gate that was between the earth and the sky. And the gate was called Babul Hafiza, the door of protection. And an angel named Ismail is the gatekeeper of Babul Hafiza. And he's the gatekeeper of the sky of this world. وَفِي حَدِيثِ جَعْفَرْ إِبْنُ مُحَمَّدٍ عِنْدَ الْبَيْحَقِ يَسْكُنُ الْهَوَاءَ فَلَمْ يَصْعَدْ إِلَى السَّمَاءِ قَطٌ وَلَمْ يَهْبِطْ إِلَى الْأَرْضِ قَطٌ إِلَى يَوْمَ مَاتِ النَّبِيِّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وسلم. This is beautiful narration here where Imam Bayhaqi in his Dala'a al-Nubuwa he narrates that this angel Ismail this angel Ismail he's an angel that hovers there in the sky in front of this gate and he keeps watch on this gate you have to remember when, when angels are created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, each one of them is given a task. They are not to do anything else except that one task. You are not to move from your post. You are not to step over the line. You are not to fulfill some other responsibility, etc. Jibreel alayhi salam is tasked with what? Being the messenger to prophets. To send the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the creation. To the ins and the jinn. And so Jibreel alayhi salam, he is given that task. Now can another angel now take up on this task? They cannot. And the beautiful thing about angels is they can't disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So since this dunya was created, however many, many millions, billions, millennia ago, this angel Ismail, who has been created and tasked with protecting the bab, the door, that distinguishes between the heaven of the earth Versus the heaven into the next life, into the, into, into the heavens, the sky of this world. He's the gatekeeper of the sky of this world. He has not moved from his post except for one occasion. And what was that occasion? Yawma mata Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The day the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam passed away. This angel Ismail was there to pay his respect to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's janazah. وَبَيْنَ يَدَيْهِ سَبَعُونَ أَلْفَ مَلَكٍ مع كل ملك جنوده مئة ألف. The, the, this, this angel Ismail, he was so powerful, right? And he's only protecting the, first, the, the sky of this dunya. And so you can't even imagine the angels that are protecting the, for the second heaven, the third heaven, the fourth heaven, etc., etc., etc. But he says, the narration says, that Ismail has an entire army at his disposal. There are 70,000 angels that are assigned to this gatekeeper angel. 70,000 angels that he commands. Under each of these 70,000 angels, there's another 100,000 angels that each of those 70,000 command. So he has this massive chain of command, an army of angels. And so this is the angel, Ismail, who never moved from his post except for one time in his life, which is to attend the janazah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so then the Prophet Sallallahu and Jibreel Alaihi Wasallam, they climbed up this staircase and the journey of Mi'raj has now officially started. So, فَاسْتَفْتَحَ جِبْرِيلُ بَابِ السَّمَاءِ Jibreel Alaihi Wasallam, then he asked for the gate to be opened. قِيلَ مَنْ هَذَا قَالَ جِبْرِيلِ Then a voice called out, Who is at the door? And Jibreel alayhi salam, he said, This is Jibreel. Right? And so, first of all, the Prophet ﷺ, he taught us adab and manners. There's an explicit narration from the Prophet ﷺ where he tells us that when you knock on someone's door and they say, Who is it? You don't play games with them. Guess who? Right? It's me. Right? And they got a guess. But you need to introduce yourself with your name. So it's very clear who you are. So we see here that Jibreel is conducting himself with this highest level of character. 
Jibreel alayhi salam, he didn't say, what do you mean, who is it? Don't you not, not know who I am? Who do you think it is? It's me, guess who, etc. So he said, no, this is Jibreel. Make it very clear who, who he is. وَمَنْ مَعَكَ قَالَ Muhammad. Then the gatekeeper angel, he said, who is with you? You're not alone. Someone is with you. And Jibreel alayhi salam, he replied, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is with me. وَقَدْ أُرْسَلِ إِلَيْهِ وفي رواية بعث إليه. And so the gatekeeper, he asked, has the Prophet Muhammad uh, uh, his time has come, right? Ursila uh, ilayhi means has he been sent, but more particularly, has he been made a messenger, right? Has, has, he, been, has he been made into a prophet? And so this tells us what? The angels were waiting for this moment. This is a special moment. They're, they're literally like, like I said, from the moment they're created, they're, they're waiting for this coming of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then even, you know, in, uh, in, uh, in the Quran, Musa alayhi salam, he says, he talks about his, his brother Harun. وَأَخِي هَارُونَ هُوَ أَفْصَحُ مِنِّي لِسَانًا فَأَرْسِلْهُ مَعْيَا Right? That my brother Harun is more eloquent than me, so send him with me so I can speak to uh, Fir'aun and, and his people. Right? Otherwise, I fear that they might reject me. So this idea, so this idea, but uh, the, the Mufassirun, they say, فَأَرْسِلْهُ مَعْيَا is actually a dua that uh, Musa alayhi salam, and this is also elsewhere in the Quran, but Musa alayhi salam, he makes a dua that what? That Harun alayhi salam also becomes a prophet. Send him, yes, yeah, send him, but in what manner? As a prophet as well. And so it's well known, this legend of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam. It was well known amongst the angels. They had been waiting for this opportunity to meet and to be in the company of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam. And so the gatekeeper angel, he wanted to know whether the Prophet Muhammad has been made a prophet yet because all the angels has been, have been told that is when he will visit the heavens. The Prophet ﷺ, when he's a prophet, he will come and visit the heavens. So neither Jibreel or the Prophet ﷺ were offended by this because they understood the angels were just doing their job properly. Making sure that the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ has been made a prophet before opening the gates to him. You know, one day, it's very beautiful, one day there is uh, one time during the Khilafah of uh, by Ibn Kathir, he uh, narrates a story where he says one time during the Khilafah of either Abu Bakr or Umar ibn Khattab, there, there was a family that was preparing for a big occasion. So they asked the treasurer of the Khalifa, where his name is Abu Ubaidah ibn Jarrah, he was like the treasurer of the, of, of the, uh, of, of the uh, Muslim world. And he is in charge of something called the Bayt al Mal, right? In charge of something called the Bayt al Mal. And so there was an allowance that would be given to this family from the Bayt al-Mal every week. This family asked for a allowance to be advanced. They asked for an advance on this allowance so that they can pre-purchase something, right? So they can pre-purchase something that they were preparing for for this big occasion. And so the Khalifa went to ask the treasurer for the advance on the paycheck. The Khalifa, the leader, is the one who went to ask the treasurer uh, uh, if they can, if this family can go get a advance on the paycheck. Abu Ubaidah ibn Jarrah he responds with a simple question. He says, "Are you certain that they will be alive until next week?" And then the Khalifa he got the message and he went home and he said, uh, "You know, it's a no go." Now Abu Ubaidah ibn Jarrah he was not being disrespectful to the Khalifa by not giving him the advance on the allowance. But he was just doing his job properly, like the gatekeeper angel. Now this lesson is so, prof this story is profound. There's so many lessons in it, right? First of all, can you imagine a treasurer talking back to the leader of the country, the president or the king, right? What would happen today? Uh, khalas, locked up. You, know, you, don't, you don't do what, uh, what, I, uh, what I want and it's over. And so no, there's a big difference between a secular state and an Islamic state. First of all, there can't possibly be an Islamic state because a state inherently, the definition of it is that it's secular. But if, if something is ruled truly by Islam, the Sharia will dictate the government, the government will not dictate the Sharia. When the government can disband the ulama, no, this is not an Islamic government at all. When the ulama are the ones that can hold the Islamic leader in check, then this is an Islamic government, right? And so a very profound lesson here that the, the treasurer, Abu Ubaidullah bin Jarrah, he fears Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
So even if the leader of the Muslim uh, 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 Ummah comes and says that I want to advance, he says, no, I can't do it. It's not my job. It's not my responsibility. I, I, I have to do my job properly that I was assigned. That you actually assigned me to do. Right? So anyways, this gatekeeper angel, he's doing his, his uh, uh, job properly. قَالَ نَعْمْ قِيلَ مَرْحَبًا بِهِ وَأَهْلًا حَيَّاهُ وَاللَّهُ مِنْ أَخٍ وَمِنْ خَلِيفَةٍ فَنِعْمَ الْأَخُ وَنِعْمَ الْخَلِيفَةُ وَنِعْمَ الْمَجِئَ الْمَجِئُ جَاءَ فَفُتِحَ لَهُمَا Jibreel alayhi salam, he said, yes, this is the Prophet of Allah. And then once it was confirmed uh, that it was indeed the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and he had, he had been granted the station of prophethood, the gatekeeper of the first heaven welcomed the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He says, marhaban, welcome, welcome. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless him and grant him a long life and a beneficial life. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant him brothers and supporters. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant him successors. And the type of followers that he can depend on when he leaves this world, and he will have the best of brothers, right? The best of companions. And he will have the best of followers. And he is the best visitor that could ever come. So this angel is making dua that the ummah of the Prophet Muhammad becomes the best. This angel is making dua that the ummah of the Prophet is an ummah of ihsan. And so he's referring here, the, the angel is referring to what? The akh, the brothers of the Prophet Muhammad now, this is implying the Sahaba, but what's very beautiful is there's another narration of the Prophet Muhammad where he says, That I, I desire, I'm, I'm looking forward to, I'm, I'm eager for the day to come where I get to meet my brothers. Right? And by extension, sisters as well. This is, this is Am. This is not Khas. This is Am. So this is a general. So brothers and sisters. قَالَ فَقَالَ أَصْحَابُ النَّبِي صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ أَوَلَيْسَ نَحْنُ إِخْوَانَكَ And so the, 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 the Sahaba of the Prophet ﷺ that were sitting with the Prophet ﷺ at the time, he, they asked him a question. They said, are we not your brothers? What do you mean you can't wait to meet your brothers? He says, لَا أَنْتُمْ أَصْحَابِ No, you guys are my companions. Which is a very high honor and it reserves its own special virtue and it's amazing and it's incredible and all of us wish we can be in their shoes, no doubt. But the Prophet Sallam, he defined who his brothers and sisters are. Who are, are the akh, the ikhwan of Rasulullah Sallallahu He says, وَلَكِنْ إِخْوَانِي الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا بِي وَلَمْ يَرَوْنِي They are the individuals who believed in me without ever seeing me. Who does that sound like? That's me and you. Insha'Allah Ta'ala. That's me and you. So when you look, when you look at this, this dua of this angel where he's saying that may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give the Prophet sallam the best brothers that could ever come. The best sisters that could ever come. One thing that I want us to do today, inshallah ta'ala, when we go home, by yourself, ask yourself, reflect. This, this is your muraqaba for tonight. This is your reflection for tonight. Am I truly the best I can be for the Prophet Muhammad Am I truly fulfilling his sunnah? Am I truly obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the way that he wants me to? Am I the dua that the angel was talking about? And if I'm not, how can I be? What do I need to change with my life? What do I need to cut out of my life? What do I need to add to my life in order to make that happen? And so Jibreel alayhi salam and the Prophet salam, they entered the first sky. And when they entered the first sky, they found a prophet that was there. Who looked just like he did on the day Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created him. <laughs> Who is this individual? Anybody know? Adam alayhi salam. Correct. Tu'radu alayhi arwahu dhurriyatihi. And so, the souls of his progeny, those of his children who were believers, they were being presented to him. And Adam alayhi salam, he says, this is a very blessed soul, this is a very blessed life, and put this soul into the highest stages of paradise. 
ثم تعرض عليه أرواح ذريته الكفار فيقول روح خبيثة ونفس خبيثة اجعلوها في سجين روح خبيثة sorry not خبيثة خبيثة um, so when the souls of his progeny who disbelieved in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala were presented to Adam alayhi salam he says this is a very wretched person this is a wretched soul put him into the depths in the prisons of the fire of hell وعن يمينه أسودة وباب تخرج منه ريح طيبة and so the Prophet ﷺ, he's watching all this, first of all. And Adam is being presented with the souls and placing them, or being, they're, uh, 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 telling them to, that they're going to be either put in Jannah or Jahannam. And so on the right side of Adam السلام, there was like this big hole, like a portal. And the portal had a door. And there was a very beautiful fragrance that was emanating from the door. وَعَنْ شِمَالِهِ أَسْوِدَةٌ وَبَابٌ تَخْرُجُ مِنْهُ رِيحٌ خَبِيثَةٌ and similarly, there was a very huge hole, almost like a black hole, on the left of Adam alayhi salam. And this por- it was like a portal that also had a door, and it, was, it had a very wretched stench coming from it. فَإِذَا نَظَرَ عَنْ يَمِينِهِ ضَحِكَ وَاسْتَبْشَرَ وَإِذَا نَظَرَ عَنْ شِمَالِهِ حَزِنَ وَبَكَ That when Adam alayhi salam looked to his right, he would grin. He would become very happy. Dahika is like he would smile so large that you can see all of his teeth. He would become very happy. His, his, his face would light up and he would become very excited. He would become very happy. But then when Adam السلام, would look to his left, he becomes very sad and he would begin to cry. فَسَلَّمَ عَلَيْهِ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ فَرَدَّ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ ثُمَّ قَالْ مَرْحَبًا بِالْإِبْنِ الصَّالِحِ وَالنَّبِيُّ الصَّالِحِ so then the Prophet Sallallahu he approached Adam Alayhi Salaam and he said salam to him. And Adam Alayhi Salaam returned the salam. And then Adam Alayhi Salaam said, Welcome, welcome, O righteous son and righteous prophet. And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam leaned over to Jibreel and asked them to be introduced to each other. Qala Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ya Jibreel, man hadha? Jibreel Alayhi Salaam, uh, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi asked him, Who is this? And he said, This is your fa- forefather. هذا أبوك آدم وهذه الأسودة نسم بنيه فأهل اليمين منهم أهل الجنة وأهل الشمال منهم أهل النار that these uh, spaces these openings that you see on either side of him are going to be the the deposit of all the souls of his progeny that the souls on the right side will be the the soul the progeny of Adam عليه السلام that are from أهل الجنة and the souls on the left are the dwellers of Jahannam and this door that you see on the right is Babul Jannah, the gate of Jannah. And this is why when he looks over at these souls entering this door, he imagines them in the gardens of paradise and he becomes happy. His face, his face lights up. He receives that good news. And then when he looks over to the door on the left-hand side, he sees the souls that are doomed for the hellfire and he cries and he becomes very sad. And the door on the on the left is called the Babul Jahannam. And the Prophet ﷺ had this exchange, had an exchange with Adam alayhi salam. Now one thing you'll notice, as we are going through the progression of the different stages of paradise, and spoiler alert, what's going to happen is at each level of paradise, the Prophet ﷺ is going to meet a prophet or two in each uh, uh, gate, in each level of paradise, right? And have a conversation with them. The details of the conversations that he had with those prophets are not known to us, right? Not, even in weak narrations, there's, 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 nothing, there's nothing established. Nothing established. We, are not, we do not know the specific conversations they had. The conversation that we know the most of is the conversation between him and Musa alayhi salam regarding the salah, which we'll get to. Maybe in like six weeks from now at this rate. I don't know. But, <laughs> but we'll, we'll get to that point. But other than that, the conversations that he had with each prophet is not really well known to us. Some scholars have tried to, uh, uh, you know, speculate some wisdoms of why these specific prophets were met. But the details are not specifically known to us. And there's a beauty in that. There's a beauty in a private conversation between the Prophet and these other prophets. Right? Not everything has to be known to us. What can, uh, there's this is a special gift for the Prophet Muhammad right? So then the Prophet he then pro, uh, proceeded very cautiously and carefully. And he, again, the Prophet was 
a veil was lifted, a hijab was lifted, and he began to see the punishments of the fire of hell. He saw some of the punishments of the fire of hell and the and the, the, the some of the, the torture of its residents. And so many of these we already discussed from the Isra journey itself, but some of the new ones that we haven't already is the Prophet ﷺ, he saw people with their bellies were inflated. That every time they try to get up, they fall forward, right? And there's a, a, a path. There's a path that is there. And so one of the punishments of the people of Fir'aun, uh, of Fir'aun and the people of Fir'aun, is that there is this path that they have to kind of run up and down nonstop until the Day of Judgment, right? This is their punishment before the actual Day of Judgment. That they run up and down this path nonstop until the Day of Judgment. And so these people whose bellies were kind of inflated are on this path. And the people of Fir'aun would come stampeding on top of them and trample them back and forth. And so the Prophet ﷺ would say, what is this, Ya Jibreel? And Jibreel salam, he responded with one ayah. الَّذِينَ يَأْكُلُونَ الرِّبَالَ لَا يَقُومُونَ إِلَّا كَمَا يَقُومُ الَّذِي يَتَخَبَّطُهُ الشَّيْطَانُ مِنَ الْمَسِ These are the people who consume interests and will stand on the Day of Judgment like those driven to madness by the touch of shaitan. Right? And so, this is very important for us to see and to hear, especially in a society where riba is almost like the default. Interest is the default. First of all, we have to learn what is actually interest and what is not interest. Because they throw that label at everything now. Just because somebody's calls something interest doesn't mean shara'an, it actually is interest. Right? And that's a whole Islamic finance talk, but we won't really get into that right now. Maybe we can do something about that later on. But what I'm just trying to say is one of the requirements that we have to know as Muslims is understand what actually is interest so that we can avoid it as much as possible. Right? And when you do understand that, when you realize that, when you realize that, um, and, and what really truly is interest and, and what to avoid, you'll see that the economic system here in America, as much as we think it is doomed and it has a lot of problems, I'm not going to deny that, there is actually a lot of ways for us to engage in this in ec economy without engaging in interest. Alhamdulillah, for now, right? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve that. Um, then another is that the Prophet Sallallahu he then moved forward and he saw people whose mouths were elongated from the front, like a camel's face, right? And they were consuming burning embers, like burning coals. And the coals would pass through their mouths and it would burn their insides and it would cause them a lot of pain and it would cause them to cry, cry out in pain. And so Prophet ﷺ said, what is this, Ya Jibreel? And Jibreel salam then he responded with an ayah of, uh, in the Quran of Surah Nisa. He says, these are the people who eat the wealth of the orphans. These are the people who feed on the poor and prey on those who couldn't defend themselves. Right? Those people are actually putting fire inside of their bellies. They will be entered into uh, the burning, blazing pits into the hellfire. Right? This is a, a verse in the Quran Surah Nisa that talks about this. And so then the Prophet ﷺ, he then moved forward and he saw people who were being tortured merc uh, 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 mercilessly. And he asked them, what is this, Ya Jibreel? And he says that, uh, the narration says that they were being hung upside down and they were crying and complaining. The Prophet ﷺ said, what is this, Ya Jibreel? Jibreel ﷺ said, these are people who engaged in fornication and adultery. Now these things, look, these things may be very hard to, to hear, let alone witness. You have to, the Prophet ﷺ witnessed these things. And who is more merciful in their heart than the Prophet ﷺ? No one is. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةَ لِلْعَالَمِينَ We have sent you not except as a mercy to mankind. And so, of course when he's seeing this, he's feeling a lot of pain, a lot of sadness, a lot of difficulty that people are going through this. The Prophet ﷺ would feel sad seeing an animal go through difficulty, let alone another human being, another brother or a sister. But the realities of these punishments needed to be disclosed to him so that he eagerly warns his ummah. And so one thing that's very important in our spirituality as Muslim is we need to develop a balance between khawf and raja. A balance between hope and a balance between fear. These two together. Now unfortunately speaking, we have grown up, and many of us have grown up this way, and I understand with one aspect, and that's the khawf. 
We got the khawf beat into us, right? Do this, you don't do this, you're gonna end up in the hellfire. Like it was like always, always punishments, punishments, punishments that were being delivered. And so now in our adulthood, what happens? One extreme breeds the other. So now we go into the opposite extreme. And for many, this is actually necessary to balance out the other extreme. If you've just been fed fear your entire lives, then go listen to 70 hours of Mufti Mink lectures. Go for it, no problem. Right? You'll get all the hope in the world, alhamdulillah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless him and preserve him. And so like, you'll get all the hope in the world that you, that, 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 that you can get. But the important thing is that after you've kind of like balanced it out within your own self, you need to now engage in a journey where you're constantly engaging with both. And the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a fear that is unique. It's not like other types of fear. Because in life, when you fear someone, when you fear an animal, when a lion comes at you, what do you do? You run away. Might not make it very far, but you'll run away. You'll try to get, you'll try to get away as fast as you can. When a bear comes at you, what do you do? We're taught to you know, like, do these certain types of things, but when you panic in the moment, what happens? You just want to get away. But the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is unique that it's not supposed to cause you to run away from Him. It's supposed to cause you to run to Him. And that's what's beautiful. It makes you turn to him, not away from him. The more you fear him, the more you will turn to him. Because the more you get to know him, the more in awe of him you become. The more majestic you realize he is. And then so we will fear that our deeds are not going to be accepted or that we will have deficiency in our deeds because you know how great and majestic and how powerful he is. That he has no flaw. And so the fear of Allah should be a deterrent from us to stop or a, a, a deterrent from sinning to get us to stop sinning. And so fear should make us obey him. So a person who fears Allah in the world will have no fear in me uh, hereafter. So we want to have fear here so we don't have fear later. We will be shaded. Those who have fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be shaded on the day of judgment. Those who have fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here will be freed from the hellfire. Those who have fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here will admit into paradise and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be happy with them. And so fear is not the end. Fear is the means to the end. And when the residents of paradise will enter paradise, Enter into paradise because now there will be no fear for you. There's no grief for you. There's no sadness for you. And then there's Raja. There's hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is known as raja in Arabic or amal or, or other words for it too. And it is to behold the vastness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy. To have full confidence in His generosity. That hoping in Allah motivates us to worship Him with joy. That when we know the rewards of our ibadah, it makes us eager and excited to do have servitude to Him. Right? And so it propels us to make dua. It makes our heart attached to him and love him. And it makes our journey to him very beautiful. And so hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a necessity for the seeker. Right? The one who is on the journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he says, the seeker would nearly perish if he lost hope even for a moment. For he moves between one, sins which he hopes will be forgiven, two, shortcomings which he hopes will be rectified, three, Righteous deeds which he hopes will be accepted. Four, steadfastness which he hopes to attain and sustain. Five, closeness to Allah and a high rank with him which he hopes to attain. And no seeker can ever afford to lose, lose sight of these hopes. And so the pious people of the past, they would advise what? They would advise during good times when we are more likely to forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because we're, you know, not desperate, we're not suffering, we're not in hardship. So it causes us to more likely forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those are the times that we should engage with the aspects of fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more. Right? You listen to a lecture about the dangers of the hellfire or the punishments of the hellfire. When times are good, so that you can remind yourself and keep that balance. When times are difficult, you engage in... Lectures that have to do with paradise. Read a hadith that have to do with the rewards of the acts of uh, 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 worship that you do. 
read the narrations and the verses of the Quran that talk about the, the rewards of patience. Right? Balance. Other scholars, they say that this should be something that's balanced out throughout one's life. That when someone is young, like a young adult, they, their fear should be more dominant over their hope. Why? Because when you're young, you got desires. When you're young, you got temptations. When you're young, you still care about the dunya. You still care about the way you look. You still care about how much money you make, etc. So in those times, for, for those that are kind of are, are still young, it's good to increase in your fear of him more than your hope. If the fear to be dominant because it keeps you in check. But towards the end of one's life, hope should be more dominant. Right? Hope should be more dominant. And Jabir anhu he said that I heard the Prophet ﷺ say, three days before his demise, none of you should die except with thinking good of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Having husna dhan of Allah. And towards the end of our life, that we think only good of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so this belie the believer is always in this state of both hope and fear. We have to balance it out. If you were on one extreme, balance it out for a little bit with the opposite extreme, but then eventually get to the point where it's 50-50. Because too much hope can make us complacent. Too much hope can make us neglectful of our duties. And too much fear can cripple us and make us despair. The way that you know if you have too much hope and, or, or too much fear, is whether or not it causes you to act. If you fail to act, if you fail to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you fail to put your faith into action, then there is a imbalance of one or the other. Whether it's too much hope, so now you think I don't have to pray, uh, pray my five prayers because Allah is the most merciful, or whether it's too much fear that you think I don't have to pray my five prayers because it doesn't matter what I do, I'm ending up in hell. Both of these causes the person to do what? To not do, actually. Uh, they don't do anything, right? That's the problem, right? They don't do. So, once someone is not acting because of how much hope or fear that they have, you know you have gone too far. That person has gone too far and that balance needs to be done. And one of the hidden benefits of fear is that it creates morality. Fear is the, actually, the driving force behind morality. It's actually one of the main points of Surah Al-Muzammil. That there's no morality without belief in the afterlife. And belief in the afterlife causes us to have this type of awe. This type of, we, I have to get prepared, I have to get ready. In the first verses of Surah Al-Baqarah, first verse of Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the characteristic traits of a believer. What is the first thing, what's the first description? Now, الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْغَيْبِ the believers, why isn't it our believers are people that believe in Allah? No, the believers are people that believe in the unseen. They're the ones who believe in the last day. They're the ones who believe in angels. They believe in hellfire. They believe in rewards. They believe in punishments. They believe in all the things that are unseen. Because when you believe in the unseen, it causes you to get ready to get prepared to act. And so back to Surah Al-Muzammil, what I wanted to say is Surah Al-Muzammil, one of the first surahs revealed to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu There's a verse in there. فَكَيْفَ تَتَّقُونَ إِنْ كَفَرْتُمْ يَوْمَ يَجْعَلُوا وَلْدَانَ شِيبَ How can you have taqwa? How can you fear Allah? How can you have piety? If you do not believe in the last day. And the last day is described as what? If you do not believe in the day in which even children's hair will turn gray. There, there's, there's horrors on this day that will cause a child their own hair to turn gray. So how can you have, how can you have piety when you don't even believe in that? So as a matter of fact, as a, a, a direct correlation to having fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that it creates morality in this world. It's what keeps people in check. It's what keeps people ready. And so that we know that it's true. And so we have to get ready for it. Now the good news is, the good news is, Alhamdulillah, for anybody that, you know, is not like freaking out or anything, inshallah not, inshallah did a good job trying to balance hope and fear here. But the good news is what? We have been told exactly how to get ready for it. So there's no problem, we just gotta do it. Inshallah ta'ala, may Allah give us tawfiq. Okay. Uh, 
looks like we're gonna have to stop here, guys. I'm sorry. It's my fault. I went on a lot of tangents today. I'll try not to do that next week. I'll try to do more of the just the story next week, inshallah ta'ala, so we can get through this a little bit quicker. Okay. Yeah, we'll conclude here. So now the Prophet ﷺ, he was at the first heaven. He met Adam ﷺ. He had a conversation with him, the details of which are unknown to us. And now he is going to be moving up towards the second heaven, right? And that is where he's going to meet uh, two prophets, right? He's going to meet two prophets in the second heaven. And we'll talk about who they are and, uh, and uh, why that's important and etc. next week, inshallah ta'ala. Anyways, uh, with that being said, I'll take one question before we conclude, inshallah. Yes? Uh, so the question is about Islamic finance class coming up. There's nothing on the schedule that I know of for sure. Is So that's an Islamic finance class or is it just like a... Okay, so on July 10th, we're uh, having an event with uh, a couple of brothers who started a Islamic investment company, and they're basically going to talk about, uh, you know, how they started it, what they did, you know, and, and kind of things like that. So there'll be kind of like some Islamic finance aspects to that, but I think you're looking more like actual, like kind of like fiqh of Islamic finance, right? Um, nothing we have specifically for that right now, but, you know, uh, it's a very important topic for us. Uh, an important topic, you know, especially for as young professionals. So um, we'll try to prioritize it, inshallah. Jazakallah khair. Yes. Oh, fiqh of inheritance? Yeah, that would be interesting. The thing is, like, fiqh of inheritance, obviously I love fiqh of inheritance. It's, it's, it's a very beautiful um, uh, chapter of fiqh because fiqh of inheritance is one of those things where you truly see the justice of the sharia come about. Uh, it's amazing. It's incredible, and how principled it is. And when when you see the fiqh of Sharia or the fiqh of inheritance, that alone will make will will, will make you convinced of Islam, right? Actually, I know someone. I'm not going to share his name because I don't think he wants me to say this. But I know someone. Uh, uh, you know, he's a very famous uh, scholar, speaker, travels around the country. Uh, he's a convert to the Deen. He accepted Islam in college just by reading fiqh of inheritance, right? He was just like, there's no way that something like this can be created by man because it's just so perfectly just, right? With that being said, fiqh of inheritance, in order to understand it properly, requires a lot of, how do I say, pre, um, a lot of other classes that you kind of have to take, right? You have to understand usul al-fiqh, you have to understand um, some of the earlier chapters of fiqh. There's a reason why in, in traditional madrasas, fiqh of inheritance is the last chapter to be taught. All right, I'll give you an example. Like for us, uh, at Al-Qalam, uh, yeah, like fiqh of inheritance was taught like towards the second half of year five. Right? So because of that, I'm hesitant to kind of do it as just kind of like a public class, if that makes sense. But it definitely is very beautiful, right? So for those that, you know, um, have, have kind of uh, done it before or for those that have kind of read about it before um, I encourage you to, to to read about it again or, or anything like that because it, it, it is a beautiful aspect of our deen for sure But yeah, does that make sense? Yeah, sorry about that <laughs> Any other questions before we come? I'll take one more. Yes, I it's a good question. Um, uh, so the question that he's asking is that in Surah An-Nisa, the one that I mentioned, right, uh, that talks about eating from the uh, from the orphan, right, and how that was the response to uh, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He responded with that ayah in Surah An-Nisa. 
He's asking, but Surah An-Nisa is supposed to be a Madani Surah. A Surah that is revealed in the uh, uh, Medina time period. So I'll have to look into it, but it is possible that this specific ayah was revealed in, in, in Meccan time period, but I don't know the answer for that for sure, but I'll, I'll, look, up, I'll look it up, inshallah, and let you know. Inshallah. Jazakallah khair. Otherwise, there would be need, need to be a, an explanation of what's going on here exactly. Yeah. Okay, inshallah, if there's no other questions, we'll conclude here. Uh, if you do have questions, um, you know, after we end, uh, you can feel free to come up and, and ask, inshallah. I'll be here until we pray uh, Maghrib, uh, brothers, because we can uh, speak after Salah and, and talk after Salah. If you can allow the sisters to be prioritized for any questions, I uh, would appreciate that. And uh, Jazakallah khair. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfiq. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the ability to do uh, amal upon what we learn. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala free our brothers and sisters in Gaza and Palestine, in Sudan, in, in Yemen, Kashmir, and all around the globe. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help and aid our brothers in China and Afghanistan and all around the globe. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give all those who are oppressed freedom and victory against their oppressors. Subhanahu wa rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.